Ladies and gentlemen, live from the Bled Festival Hall, the 2022 Bled Strategic Forum. The history of the human race has been shaped by conflicts and wars. It has been shaped by one rule. In the middle of the last century, it became apparent that when it meets technological progress, the rule of power can lead to complete self-destruction of the human race. There is no place to hide. There is only one world, one planet, one life. Establishing new rules of the game has become a necessity. We needed to start cooperating, connecting, and working together. Thus, we started our journey. From monologue to dialogue, from conflict to compromise, from human life as collateral damage to human life as dignity, from life as an economic measure to living on the paradigm of sustainable development. It seems that in the last few decades, the world has indeed moved from the rule of power to the power of rules. But it takes very little to disturb this fragile balance. Our journey is a continuous process that requires the effort of the entire international community, from the superpowers to the smallest stakeholders. It is critical to safeguard democracy, human rights, and the rule of law while addressing the global challenges affecting our planet and civilization. We are at a decisive point in history. Rules are being rewritten as we speak, and power is once again dictating the world's agenda. Instead of a multilateralism of equal partners, we seem to be moving towards a confrontation of the democratic versus the non-democratic world. Is global economic and political cooperation among stakeholders with vastly different values sustainable in the long run? 
What is the red line that marks out where cultural differences become human rights violations and breaches of international law? Is there still a way for dialogue and mutually acceptable compromise to prevail? Or is a global clash inevitable? What is the future of democracy? We need to address global challenges, the transatlantic relationship. of the Bled Strategic Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General of the Bled Strategic Forum, Mr. Peter Girk. Dear Presidents, Prime Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Pozdravljeni, Dobar dan. Welcome to the 17th edition of the Blessed Strategic Forum. Uh, let me thank again uh, our own Giga Pirnat for the composition and video, and music was performed by Music for the Future Orchestra, comprising of young Ukrainian musicians who found shelter in Slovenia, joining forces with their Slovenian colleagues under the leadership of Živa Ploj Peršu. Thank you very much again. When preparing uh, this year's discussion, it was uh, very clear that there are some dates, some events, which become a part of collective memory and represent a point of no return. One of such dates came about this year, and it will be forever remembered as a day when the rule of power once again challenged the rule, the power of rules. On 24th February, Russia attacked Ukraine. Processes and challenges which will reshape our lives have been put in motion. One president recently said quite clearly, days of abundance are over. The truth is we need to readjust, we need to adapt, and we need to find ways to tackle various shapes and forms of crisis, be it security crisis, be it energy crisis, be it food crisis, democracy crisis, COVID, climate change, human rights, and the list goes on and on and on. While confronting these challenges, our guidance should be upheld at all times. We should not lose our values, our norms, our standards. The struggle we are facing is not an opportunity, no matter how much you hear this story. No, it's not an opportunity. This struggle is a matter of survival, our survival. In the next two days, Bled Strategic Forum is going to address the most pertinent and consequential issues. To do that, we are honored that we have assembled a prominent list of speakers who took their time for their, from their busy schedules to come to Bled and try to contribute a little piece of the puzzle called change, because they care, because they know that only honest and open discussion can pave the way forward to a true and sustainable change. Before I give the floor to our host, Minister of Foreign Affairs, allow me to thank my team. 
Bled Strategic Forum believes in change, and we believe this change is possible. This is why everyone worked relentlessly to make our gathering happen. Actually, uh, over the years, I ran out of words to show my gratitude to my team, but let me, let me try uh, once again. Thank you very much. Uh, you are irreplaceable. And the same goes to our partners and supporters and friends who support us over the years. Thank you also uh, from our side. And now, let the 17th Bled Strategic Forum begin. Allow me to pass the floor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia, Ms. Tanja Fajon. Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Slovenia, Ms. Tanja Fajon. Thank you very much, dear Peter. You are irreplaceable with your team, too. Dobar dan, lepo pozdravljeni na Bledu, dear Presidents, dear Madam President of the European Commission, Prime Ministers, fellow Ministers, guests, dear ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to Slovenia, to Bled, to our strategic forum. Each time I visit Bled, I wonder, why don't we build cities in the countryside where the air is much cleaner? I have to confess that I borrow this one from the collected jokes of Slavoj Žižek, the renowned Slovenian philosopher. He's one of our guest speakers, and he will share his reflections on Europe and the challenges of our time. We are delighted that we have managed to attract so many distinguished guests to this year's events at such short notice. Thank you to each and every one of you joining us in Blit. The new Slovenian government took office on 1st June this year. At the height of preparations for the Blit Strategic Forum, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Blit Strategic Forum team for organizing this event so excellently and for all their hard work. This year's forum takes place amid very challenging times for Europe and the entire world. And it will not be the first time this is the case. The last two forums took place with restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We probably all anticipated that once the pandemic was over, the world would return to normal. But we did not anticipate that war on European soul would become our new reality. This new reality has chosen the main topics of this year's event for us and the strategic consequences and the challenges it has created for Europe, the European Union and the world. Allow me to highlight a few of the challenges. First of all, we should all be concerned with the fact that a decades-long project of reuniting Europe after the World War II has been halted with the war in Ukraine. We do not want to see another Iron Curtain in Europe, but unfortunately, there is little that we can do to prevent it at this very moment. The post-Cold War European security architecture has been seriously shaken and it may collapse. What is important, however, is that we do not close all the doors to emergency communication. The recent worrying developments at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant have clearly shown the importance of maintaining open communication channels and functional international organizations, in this particular case, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Secondly, it is vital that the existing divisions are not exported to the global level. To some extent, this is already happening. Countries have started to position themselves and alliances have been forgotten. Crisis situations like the recent one in the Taiwan Strait region begin to occur. New informal international formats are also expected to emerge, while the existing 
formal multilateral forums and mechanisms might become dysfunctional. That said, some new formats have proven to be very valuable, like the one bringing together Ukraine, Russia, Turkey and the United Nations. Their agreement resulting in exports of fertilizer and grain from the Black Sea port is highly valuable, particularly for underdeveloped countries. Overall, to say the least, the situation is very worrying for, I believe, the vast majority of countries in the world which do not have the strength and the capacity to shape the reality. These countries, the majority of us that are destined to mostly accept the developments, want a functional, rules-based international order. In fact, we desperately need a much more effective multilateralism system to deal with global challenges such as poverty, inequality, polarization, climate change, and many other problems. Slovenia is among the countries that are fully committed to multilateralism and continuously promote cooperation within the UN system. With this in mind, we are running for a non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council for the 2024-2025 term. On top of that, and this is my third point, we, the EU members and the institutions, have to do our homework within the European Union. While we advocate against the divisions in Europe and the world, we are bound to pledge unity within the Union. I appeal from this podium today to sovereignists and populists all across Europe not to trade EU unity, solidarity, compromise, and joint efficiency for egoism and cheap political points in domestic political arenas. EU unity and solidarity is shared importance for all of us. The EU institutions and every single member state, particularly during the current crisis. Furthermore, it is important to note that a fully functional, prosperous European Union cannot be built exclusively as the lowest common denominator of national interests. The EU requires a glue. The shared values of the rule of law, human rights, freedom of the media, to solidify the structure. It is not only prosperity, but also these values that make Europe such an attractive place to live for all our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, our economists, just bouncing back from the devastating blows of the pandemic, are facing new insecurities. These ones perpetrated by rising supply and energy costs. Our citizens, exhausted by the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions, are facing new fears related to growing food and energy prices. Energy diversification, finding alternative gas and oil sources to prevent potential energy shortages in the winter is an absolute priority for most of the European governments. To clarify, while we will continue to rely on polluting energy sources this winter out of necessity, we remain fully committed to green transition. In other words, green transition is not only our political commitment, we are firmly convinced that it is the most important investment in the future. Related to this, let me proudly inform you the last month on the initiative of five countries, including Slovenia, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution declaring the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable living environment and extending the scope of human rights protection to address some of the most pressing challenges of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, not everything is so gloomy. Indeed, we might have more questions than answers, but undoubtedly, we will find solutions. Including with the assistance of the Blade Strategic Forum, I'm sure your discussions will help us find a positive way forward. While there is solidarity, there is hope. And this year we have witnessed many manifestations of solidarity, supporting a country under attack, implementing sanctions even though we know that they will hurt our economies, countries helping each other tackle fires and natural disasters, people reaching out with humanitarian assistance to their neighbors, refugees, 
those less fortunate and many others. In Slovenia and elsewhere, we have experienced a rain-free summer, a time of extreme drought and water scarcity when fires have raged across Europe. We have seen a strong cooperation, unselfishness, and the helping hand of our people, which makes me a very proud citizen of this country. Ladies and gentlemen, we must remain united in responding to our common challenges. This quote, united we stand, divided we fall, which has been used many times in the past, is not just empty words. As the United Nations summarized the importance of achieving sustainable development goals in Agenda 2030, our ultimate goal must be and remain to leave no one behind. One final thought before the end of my address. Do not leave Blit without trying the soft power of this place. The sweet cake called Krimshnita. Without swimming in the lake and without enjoying a walk around its perimeter. And all this is a part of the experience called the Blit Strategic Forum. I wish you plenty of interesting debates and a very enjoyable stay in my country, our country, Slovenia, and thank you all for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Borut Pahor. Madam President, Mr. President, Madam Speaker, Prime Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. After the Second World War, the Iron Curtain descended across Europe, dividing it into the Democratic West and the Communist East. This block division lasted until 1990s, until the fall of Berlin Wall, the collapse of Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, and the emergence of new sovereign and democratic states, Slovenia among them. So, Europe has witnessed 30 years ago a great condensing of history, with the exception of the Western Balkans. It unfolded peacefully, promising a better future for all the continent and the entire world. And today, 30 years later, particularly due to the war in Ukraine, it seems that a prospect of a new bloc division looms over Europe. It might, it might once again split it into a democratic West and authoritarian East, with the border between them also marking the boundary of Russia's zone of interest and influence. Although it might be too early to talk about all its possible ramifications, there can be no doubt that any new division would be bad news for the Europe, of the Europe, and for the world. A new bloc division would imply a kind of recycling of history, resurrecting not only the issue of so-called hard security, but also the question of the fu fundamental values, including democracy. History has taught us that bloc division is not a solution, it is a problem. It brings along the state of fragile, constantly threatened peace, accompanied by an arms race, proxy wars, and agonizing efforts for a peaceful resolution. If it is true that the war in Ukraine and its consequences might lead to a new bloc division, we should be concerned about whom it will divide and what this implies for the Europe and the international community. If President Putin's objective is to restore and consolidate a large sphere of influence for the Russian Federation, 
leaving no room for the countries in this zone to move closer to the EU and NATO, then the turmoil will last as long as it takes for Moscow to establish such a sphere. One way or another, Putin will demand of the countries along its border to make a decision. Or else, he might take the decision for them by sanctioning them, perhaps even by force. In my speech, I would like to focus on just one consequence of this possible new division. The question of where its border might run in the Western Balkans and why. This could be the next central question for peace and security in Europe. If it, is, if it is holds true that the newly emerging Russian sphere of interest, of influence, will leave no room for countries aspiring for, to join the EU and NATO, then this new geopolitical division might make the Western Balkans part of the Western world. This, however, depends mostly on the decision taken in Brussels as much as on those taken by countries of the Western Balkan. The longer the EU enlargement process, the more these countries are prone to Russia's aspiration, or at least to Russia's growing influence. This is why Slovenia has been working for years towards swift and decisive EU enlargement to the Western Balkans. This is, in our view, a central geopolitical issue. It is also possible that the new bloc division might run across the middle of the Western Balkans, and this is a cause for concern. I find it hard to imagine this could unfold without security risk. In this respect, Bosnia and Herzegovina seems to be of key importance. Slovenia is doing everything in its power to convince the EU and the West to fast track the accession of Bosnia and Herzegovina to the EU and, if possible, to NATO. Should the conflicts in Bosnia and Herzegovina escalate, this might pose a serious security risk for the country, for the region, and for the Europe. Now it is time to understand and resolve this problem. Since our dear guest here is also the president of the European Commission and our dear friend, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, I would like to reiterate Slovenia's proposal that Bosnia and Herzegovina be granted candidate status this year and, if possible, without any condition whatsoever. For the purpose of this conference and as a friend of Serbian President Vucic and the president of Serbia, allow me to make another remark in this context. In my opinion, Serbia will play a decisive role if it, is, if it is comes to the division of Europe in the Western Balkans. Here I am referring to Serbia's traditional security, political, economic, cultural, and emotional attachment to Russia. I would like Serbia's policy to help keep the whole of the Western Balkans on the Western European side. However, this is a complex issue, and I believe we must address it as such. The point is that Serbia would probably be willing to risk a break with Russia only if given firm, very firm assurance about its place in the European Union. But it's not completely sure about this. In my view, we must do everything in our power so that our action convince Serbia to strengthen its political will for European perspective. Getting Serbia on board with the Western European option would be in turn greatly contribute to resolving problems in Bosnia and Herzegovina, not to mention the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. In this context, we must insist on our three expectations. Number one, that Serbian official policy rejects the idea of so-called Serbian world, Srpski svet. Number two, that Serbia rejects separatist tendencies in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
And number three, that Belgrade successfully concludes the dialogue with Pristina. Ladies and gentlemen, from what has been said, we can see that the European Union has a major role to play on issues related to the ramif uh, ramifications of the war in Ukraine and to the situation in the Western Balkans. In my opinion, the EU should make a much greater effort to draw the Western Balkans into its zone of influence and also its membership. I am aware that some are very concerned about the political costs of this course of events. But experience has taught us that the price of indecision can be much, much higher and much sadder. I believe that there is still time to act. However, consensus must be reached in Brussels as soon as possible that the enlargement of the Western Balkans has become, become a key geopolitical issue. In hope that we will succeed it. in these endeavors, I thank you for your attention and wish you a all successful work at the forum. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the European Commission, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen. President Paho, dear Borut, Prime Minister Golob, dear Robert, Presidents, Prime Ministers, Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, many, many thanks for inviting me here to the Bled Strategic Forum. It's wonderful to see this packed room here. And indeed, this is a forum which has become unmissable by now as a gathering for the foreign policy community and as an event of European and global relevance. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Now, this year's headline, we've seen it on the screen while this fantastic orchestra was playing. This year's headline perfectly sums up the most relevant question of our times. Will the rule of power replace the power of rule? And I believe that the answer to this question boils down to one line. It all depends on the power of democracy. It all depends on our capacity to uphold fundamental principles, to resist aggression, to protect our values and our friends. It is no understatement to say that the world has been watching our response to Russia's aggression very closely. The stakes are clear to everyone. At the beginning of this year, Russia and China have openly declared a so-called unlimited friendship. And only weeks later, Russia launched its war against Ukraine, weeks later. The message couldn't be more explicit. So if we are to preserve basic principles such as self-determination and the inviolability of borders, Putin cannot win this war, and Ukraine must win this war. This is absolutely clear. <laughs> and this is why we have mobilized our economic might like never before. In a matter of days and weeks, we have approved the most far-reaching sanctions ever implemented. And the sanctions are causing colossal damage to the Kremlin's ability to wage war. Putin himself has admitted it. And the damage will only grow over time. Besides this, we have supported financially Ukraine with more than 10 billion euros since the beginning of the war, and I'm not including the bilateral support of our member states. 
And we are working on the next tranche. More has to come for Ukraine. This is very clear, my message to our member states. And we used, for the first time ever, resources from the European budget on military equipment to sustain Ukraine's brave defense effort. We will support Ukraine as long as it takes. We are doing it for Ukraine. We are doing this to uphold our European values. But we are also doing this to show to Russia and the world that breaking internationally shared rules comes with a massive cost. That has to be very clear. This effort must come together with a new European strategic thinking. And today I would like to pin down three of its main tenets. First, to defend the rule of law and the rule-based order over time, we must neutralize Russia's blackmail ability and strengthen our own capabilities to act. Second, we must support democracies that are most exposed to foreign threats. And I'm not only thinking about Ukraine, but also about the Western Balkans. And third, we must also look further to global geopolitical shifts and use our economic might to preserve and expand the rules-based global order. My first point means primarily ending our dependence on dirty Russian fossil fuels. And our work here is well underway. We are diversifying our supplies at lightning speed. The gas supplies from sources other than Russia has increased by 31 billion cubic meters since January this year. And this compensates by now the Russian cuts of gas supply to Europe. We're also cutting substantially our need of imported gas because we have to prepare for potential full disruption of Russian gas. And for this, we have asked member states to reduce the gas consumption by 15% and save it to the storage. That can save up to 45 billion cubic meter of natural gas. And ultimately, the best way to get rid of Russian fossil fuels is of course to speed up our transition to green energy sources. Every kilowatt hour of electricity that Europe generates from solar, from wind, from hydropower, from biomass, from geothermal or green hydrogen makes us less dependent on Russian fossil fuels. So invest in that. If you look at the facts, the evidence, today the price of wind and solar is cheaper than polluting fossil fuels. And that's why with our Repower EU initiative, we will invest together 300 billion euros to accelerate the green transition. For instance, we are now financing one of the largest offshore wind farms of the world in the North Sea. And tomorrow, I will be in Denmark to discuss exactly similar initiatives, a huge offshore wind farm in the Baltic Sea. So, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, the era of Russian fossil fuels in Europe is coming to an end. And with freedom from blackmail, we will come greater power to defend global rules. That has, be, has to be our next strategic approach. Ending our dependency on Russian fossil fuels is only the first step. The skyrocketing electricity prices are now exposing, for different reasons, the limitations of our current electricity market design. It was developed for completely different, under completely different circumstances and completely different purposes. It is no more fit for purpose. And that's why we, the Commission, are now working on an emergency intervention and a structural reform of the electricity market. We need a new market model for electricity 
that really functions and brings us back into balance. And then we have to look, of course, beyond energy. The green and digital transition will massively increase our need for raw materials. Take lithium for batteries, or silicon metal for chips. Take rare earth to produce magnets for electric vehicles and wind turbines. Demand for them may double by 2030. And if you look at the European demand for lithium batteries, it is set to increase at an annual rate of 40% between, between 2020 and 2025. 40% rise per year, the demand. Now, the good news in that is it means that the European Green Deal is progressive. The not so good news is one country dominates the processing. Out of the 30 critical raw materials today, 10 are mostly sourced from China. So we have to avoid falling into the same dependency as with oil and gas. We should not replace old dependencies with new ones. So we must make sure that access to these commodities will not be used to blackmail us. We have to diversify the supply and build new ties with reliable, like-minded partners around the globe. For this purpose, for example, I'm traveling in two weeks to Canada, like-minded partners with very interesting offers. The power of democracies also depends on building strong foundations with like-minded partners for the economy of tomorrow. My second thought, we must strengthen those who believe, like us, in the value of rules and bring them even closer. I'm thinking, of course, first and foremost about Ukraine. The Kremlin's invasion aimed to pull Ukraine back towards a darker past, but instead we are seeing the brave determination of Ukrainians to continue on their chosen path and even speed up their process of transformation as they rebuild their country. It's amazing to see this effort and this determination and this passion that they show. The new Ukraine, I'm deeply convinced, will have stronger institutions, a modernized judiciary, but also be greener, more digital, and more a resilient economy. To get there, and we're aware of that, Ukraine will need to channel enormous resources for reconstruction, map investment needs, coordinate action. All of this in support of an ambitious reform agenda, so the big tasks ahead of us. Therefore, with Ukraine in the lead, a reconstruction platform can achieve these goals. A platform open to all who care about the future of Ukraine and to advise on the best way forward. We have to be very precise. It's a huge responsibility that we have to tackle. And therefore, to this purpose, Ukraine, together with the European Commission and the German G7 presidency, will co-host an international conference in Berlin on the 25th of October. We will bring together in this conference renowned experts, international organizations, think tanks, academics, but also, and that's very important for me, the private sector and civil society. Civil society, because the young people of Ukraine dream of a better future, rightly so. A prosperous, a fair, a green, a more democratic Ukraine. They are so right, a peaceful Ukraine, a flourishing Ukraine. And because the path of modernization, the path of democracy, is also the path that leads to the European Union, we are at your side and we want to support you in this endeavor. And the same is true for the Western Balkans. Let there be no doubt. Auf, our friends from the Western Balkans are part of our European family. The Danube, 
The Adriatic and the Balkan mountains have always been a link, never a border. Our economies are tied together after centuries of trade and travel. So prosperity in the Balkans depends entirely on their integration in the rest of Europe. Most importantly, the people of the Western Balkan overwhelmingly aspire to join the European Union. Yet, we know in recent years, progress has been slowed. Not least by international actors, including Russia, who seek to undermine democratic institution building and the rule of law. We have, as European Union, a clear strategic interest that all Western Balkan six keep advancing on the path towards European membership. Because Balkan, Western Balkan stability is European stability, and Western Balkan prosperity is also European prosperity. So how can we reinvigorate the European perspective for the Western Balkans? I think we must first and foremost push the integration of our economies even further. And that's why we have launched the economic and investment plan of 9 billion euros funding with the potential of mobilizing more than 20 billion euros of investments for the Western Balkan. All of this is groundwork towards our common future in the European Union. And we must strengthen the credibility of our accession process. We must make sure that every step a country takes towards democracy, the rule of law, and equal rights brings it closer to the European Union. That's why the opening of accession process and negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia was a true milestone. We had set clear conditions for this, and they have delivered. The people and the democracies have delivered. It was a huge democratic success for the people of Albania and North Macedonia, but also for the rest of Europe and for our strategic interests. The best way forward to contrast foreign influence by autocratic countries is to strengthen democracies in Europe. It is about ge geopolitics, yes, but it is also about our common values. And finally, we must also look beyond Europe and beyond the geopolitics of our immediate neighborhood. The power of democracies, our ability to shape the world of tomorrow, depends greatly on whether we are able to have a growth model and an economic model that works for all. A growth model that is fit for the challenges of this century, starting with climate change and with the digitalization of all economic sectors, there's an urgent need to lay down a material infrastructure of the future world economy. One that is truly sustainable for our planet and that delivers prosperity by the greatest number of people. Because investment and infrastructure continue to shaping the rules of our world, they can promote a free and fair trade instead of financial dependence. They can protect our environment instead of exploitation and polluting. They can build international relations based on trust instead of economic blackmail. And this is why we have put forward Global Gateway, 300 billion euros of investment. This is our approach to big infrastructure projects, value-based, transparent, open to the private sector, infrastructure that delivers lasting benefits to local communities. And by doing so, we want to show the power of a value-driven investment agenda. We know what investment by other countries can look like. Take, for example, Russia. The price to pay for oil and gas is loss of sovereignty and loss of independence. They don't want partners. They want vassals. And it's not just the Kremlin. Tens of countries are on the brink of default because they cannot pay their debt with China. And a few have 
already defaulted. The Financial Times calls it emerging Belt and Road Debt Crisis. Development loans that ignore environmental and social standards, that cut short on risk management and lack transparency, these cannot deliver what countries need. There is a better way. And it is up to us to make it work in all corners of the world. It is not just the future of several countries that hangs by a threat. It is the future of the rules-based order. This is our responsibility as democracies of our days and our age. And I want Europe to live up to it for our own sake and for the world's sake. And therefore, thank you for listening. Have a great conference and long live Europe.